Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and as always, I'm going to remind you of those two ancient cultures from which that those phrases came from. Namaste comes from the Indian culture long ago, written, it's called Sanskrit, spoken, it's called Brahmi. The meaning is that the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. The other side of the world, the Mayan culture, offered in La Ketch, which simply means I am another you. So here's a couple of ancient cultures pointing to the reality that we are so interconnected that we don't realize it. So imagine that. Bring that into your own being as you're greeting people on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't necessarily have to say it, but just feel it. See the difference that it makes in your own life. Don't believe me? Check it out for yourself. All right? So this week's guest is Victor Vorsky. Victor and I met, oh gosh, over a year ago on, uh, uh, I think it was a Friendship Bench um, conversation, and maybe it was a GRC. Oh, that's what it was. It was um, global... Uh, or a uh, global collab, a regenerative collab conversation that we had. And uh, we found a, a quick friendship and went from there. He's got an MBA and uh, also a degree in computer science. He's uh, developed a company called Earth Sky Lab. He's also the co founder of Rebuild, which is a regenerative community building virtual experience and on ground experience with some of the events that they've developed which is how we first met and he also has been um, keen on the idea of imagineering and being able to see things and begin to figure out how to incorporate them as a conscious creative collaborative individual victor welcome Good to see you here. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to our conversation today. Oh, me too. It's been a long time coming. Uh, and from that first community rebuilding, or uh, rebuild community uh, regenerative project that really what brought uh, 40, 50 different speakers together and had... Oh, the 120 or something? The very first one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was oh, over wow. Uh, I think more than I thought. Over over a hundred, and there are six hundred participants all together. And then we've done a number of in-person get-togethers in Holland, Portugal, Costa Rica. This year, did a new kind of uh, event, a gathering of regenerative tribes in Portugal with some three hundred people gathering. So everything around the regenerative movement, which is growing, and. Uh, trying to figure out what it is and what it means and we're with it growing and trying to figure out what what rebuild wants to be as an organization yeah. and uh yeah we're, and that's we're a really powerful place to be now before we continue a lot not everyone's a privy or understands what regenerative actually means would you kind of define what that is so uh i i will preface that with I am not an expert, so I can. I'm happy to share what it means to me, uh, but I'm not, claiming, I'm not claiming to be an authority. And uh, so there is two ideas that I like. One is quoting from Jenny Anderson. She's a thinker in the regenerative space, and she says, "Regeneration is about healing the story of separation between man and nature and man and man." Uh, the story, right? Because uh, as you pointed out, we are not separate, but there is a strong so story of separation, of all kinds of separations that is running through our culture and through our reality. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody can identify some. So well, and it was exacerbated you know? with COVID too, where we the narrative was be afraid of everybody, right? Sequester yes. yourself, lock yourself up, don't go out. Um, Definitely. So I I do think this is, uh, for me personally, I really do think that on many uh, 
uh, axis, our society, many dimensions, our society has lit, reached the limit of how far we can push separation between people. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the mental health epidemic that we're living through everywhere in the Western world is a symptom of all of those separations that we're forced to live with, which are not natural to us as humans. You know, we are connection machines and being forced to live in isolation and to live this story of separation is just driving us mad. Uh, so Agreed. that's one. And then the other one I really like from Daniel Christian Wall. He's one of the key thinkers in this space uh, where he says regeneration is not a framework. It's not a series of answers. You know, it's not sustainability 2.0. It's a bunch of questions for us to engage with together. And I really like this idea, you know, like what does it mean for us to live and help the environment be more biodiverse? It's a question. And I think questions are much more powerful than answers because the good questions stay forever. The questions that the philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, the religious thinkers, you know, the questions that they posed are all still valid. What does it mean to be a good husband, a good human, a good member of society? And, uh, you know, how do you grow yourself as a person? All of the questions still remain. Right. A lot of the old frameworks, especially a lot of the old religious frameworks, if you try and, you know, phrase the answers in some kind of dogmatic, long dogmatic text that made sense 400, 1,000 or 3,000 years ago, a lot of because the reality has changed. The answers change, but the questions remain the same. Also, I really love this idea of coming together uh, over questions because this allows us, you know, if you and I have the same question uh, and we're like, we're passionate about the question, I can look and if your answer is quite different uh, to that question, I can look at it with more curiosity. It's like, wow, we're trying to we're passionate about the same question, but your answer is completely different than mine. Well, at least we're aligned on the question. Let us together explore and have a dialogue about why our answers are different. Right. So I think in that sense, you know, meeting together over shared questions is much more powerful and much more opening to dialogue and exploration and thus creativity. Totally agree with it. And the experience of that is quite different than a prescriptive answer kind of thing, which is what the command and control kind of, of environments that we've come out of over the last century or so. And now we're in this evolving generative kind of experience where we are exploring those answer, those questions. And we're willing to, finally, Instead of thinking everybody's got their own answer or that I've got my answer and it, it's right, I have a partial, I have my perspective, like you mentioned earlier, what's it mean, what regenerative, uh, the term means to you. We each have a different dictionary from which we're speaking and listening from. And so being able to apply those different dictionaries to a question gives us the opportunity to probe that question from all kinds of different perspectives that we may never have thought about until we hear the perspective of another. And combined, those potential answers, solutions, quite even further questions, right? Oftentimes, then I'm, maybe you found this, do you, do you find that within the question and the pause for reflection, the answer just seems to rise to the surface or at least a potential one. Do you find that to be true? Uh, yes, when the, when the answers are out there, but I've also come to accept uh, as I've gotten older. Sometimes they aren't. Some questions are there just for you to wrestle for for the rest of your life. You know, it's like the the Zen koan idea from Zen Buddhism, right? right? It's not about finding the answer of what the hell the sound of one hand clapping is. The whole point is to twist your brain around the thing. It's the, you know, like the, the point of lifting weights is not to get the weight up. 
similarly, for some of the questions, the point is not to find an answer. The, the point is to enrich your idea space, enrich your the way you look at the world by grappling with it. Right, right. And it's so enriching in doing so. Now, speaking of, uh, of the enrichment process, right, there's many, not all, I, I noticed that in the coming out of the pandemic, there's been like a huge awakening, for lack of a better, of people asking questions or being willing to explore them. And then there are those that, it, and I'm, could be wrong, but I'm, I'm making a, a, an assertion that you had that kind of experience when you were younger of being able to understand the, the curiosity and the capacity for reflection and maybe even considering it as an inner connection that you had to life that maybe you didn't notice others had, or maybe you did. It, it, that being so, what kinds of things did you notice when you were younger that began to create that inner connection with the rest of life and with, and with nature? So, I mean, uh, I can recall two anecdotes uh, from, from my youth. Uh, I, know, I know you had a, like a concrete boom awakening I don't think I don't <laughs> yeah, think I was I, one of those that got the cosmic two before upside the head, right? Yeah, I don't think I ever had anything that was so dramatically impactful. Uh, but it's more like, you know, a slow rolling out process throughout the course of my life. I just turned 50 last week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Oh, happy uh, birthday. Thank you. And so it, it's, you know, it's been a 50 year long process. Uh, for some, it takes longer, but certainly I do remember, and I will, you know, grateful for my whole life. My grandmother, may she rest in peace. You know, I, I was, my, both my parents were working. So my vacations, they would send me with my grandmother, my uh, mother's mother off to the mountains. And we would just go walking, you know, I mean, she was, she was young, but I mean, she was still uh and we just go walking through these small hills and uh, meadows and just kind of, yeah, just wandering through there and, and really enjoying the forest and the mountains. And I really remember that being my kind of deeper youthful nature connection and sure. that really made me fall in love with nature. On the flip side, I... Uh, I remember, you know, we grew up in, I grew up in Poland in the 1970s. And uh, when I was five, five, six, we moved to a, one of those long communist concrete apartment blocks, mm. which actually by, you know, <laughs> they're nicer than British social housing. Uh, they were there functionally, they were super nice, right? They were newly built. They were warm, clean, you know, it was, but now I know this, you know, I, I can back analyze this, but there was zero nature because, you know, they just kind of stripped the whole thing. Now there is some more trees and stuff 40 years later, but at the time there was nothing. It was just, I still remember as a kid, they, they had like kind of left the thing and there was like a massive puddle, you know, like half a parking lot worth of puddle. And we used to go and play in that. Huh. Uh, so it was, you know, at least mud is some nature, right? As a kid, you appreciate it, but nothing green and zero community. And I remember, you know, we'd go to my other grandmother who lived in a house outside of a mid-sized town, you know, just kind of, and there it was a house, so there was a garden, there were chickens, you know, it was multi-generational, so there were my cousins to play with. And I remember I got this flash of memory, we're driving back from there, and I noticed that I feel better in my grandmother's house than I do in my own house. Mm. And I remember, feeling a sense of curiosity or puzzlement about this or regret or something, but like really noticing. And yeah, so I noticed as a child that I felt better in this environment, which was green. You know, it's, it's not like the forests of Montana or something, but there were some trees, it was green, there was chickens, there was community. 
and I felt that as a child that I feel better in this environment than in this other one, which is my home. Right, right. And I totally can understand that. I mean, here you are in this concrete jungle, so to speak. Um, and then the experience of being in a village, basically, where people knew each other, they were conversant, there was community, there was nature. I grew up in a similar environment. I had a woods that was mm, third of a mile that I could walk to, and I would spend the entire day by myself in the woods. Wow. Amazing. And, yeah, it, it just... And children today don't really have that kind of opportunity to do so. So to expect them to understand things from that kind of perspective doesn't really work because they have no way to do so, right? Um, so how do we provide that? Which is part of what the regenerative community activities are about is restoring that kind of natural and nature driven environment for people to experience and, and especially with the remote working kind of idea where you can choose to work uh, or where you work from now that uh, it's um in that process and you notice that uh, i was really intrigued by how you could feel the difference it wasn't an uh, an intellectual process that you went through it was that internal realization of the feeling right which is really how we're driven right we're driven by our emotions so which would you choose had you um, if you had the choice right so how did this kind of evolve and because you went into a very uh, analytically driven environment with computer science and and that kind of direction what was it that you took from the the younger youthful experiences of connectivity and the notion of being able to move into a digital environment with it so uh i mean i think for me my formative experiences because after that when i was nine years old we moved to kuwait so going from one surreality of late socialist poland to early petrodollar Middle East. So mm -hmm. from one surreality to another. Wow. And then moving to Canada four years later, I think the definitely this third culture kid was very formative for me. And the way I describe it is when you move between move or you can live in one place, but experience, you know, there's many cities in the US where two blocks over, you have a completely different culture. So you can have the same Absolutely. experience without moving across the world. But when you are exposed to two quite different cultures, what you realize is how much of what's normal is a cultural convention. And I think once you realize this, it's a small and natural step to, well, if normality is a cultural convention, I could just imagine my own convention. And invite participants. Yeah. Right. Which is, you know, I think as movement makers, this is kind of what we're doing, right? We believe that a different reality, a different set of normal is possible. Mm -hmm. And because this is the first step in making anything happen, right? You first right. have to believe that it's possible. Well, and, and you and I both have experienced that to some degree. Whether, you know, moving around the world or around the valley, such as I have here and, and living in a few other places in the country, uh, there is this experience that trumps a belief system, right? We know it's possible because we've experienced it. And if we can, others can too. So how, how did you notice that coming up in the the experience around you as you grew grew older because i realize we're not into the computer science phase yet and we've got some exploration to do in, in the precursor well, i think again you know i i i can't claim uh, great early insights uh, myself but i think i always had a natural resistance 
to systems or rules which I didn't feel made sense or mm -hmm. that that served me. You know, uh, again, I don't claim any great wisdom. Uh, there's this this whole complex of highly sensitive person. Are you familiar with that? Absolutely, been so deep I on think, myself at times. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'm definitely that. And yeah, I just kind of had a built-in immune system against bullshit systems, I think. Sure. Well, and again, the BS, the belief system, right? We're, we're looking for something that's experiential, that has proof rather, you know, because words are generally empty when they're prescriptive, right? You can sense that this is, a, this is a command and control kind of activity rather than one that nurtures that common sense in order to make sense common right yeah um, so how did this um when you recognize this and and i would offer that you know looking at the term anarchy right it's not chaos it's not confusion it simply means self-rule right yeah self-rule so, by by free association right which is generally you're going to do things that are good for you and not necessarily to the detriment of others right because if you're doing something that's that to the detriment of others you're going to feel that yourself and why would you do that right it doesn't feel good so how what were the things that you noticed in the process that that um that seemed evident of needing change needing change uh, you mean in the world or in myself in the, well both actually because it, as we reflect in one you know our, our view of the world changes because we change our view right so in this process what did you see that you mentioned some of the things but what are, what else did you see as evidence of the need for change in other words what wasn't working and had, how did it show the disconnectedness of others in the world around you? Yeah, so, I mean, I think for me, the easiest is to, to skip ahead to the last 20 years or so. Okay. Uh, uh, because, you know, in terms of actual realizations, that's when my realization started much later in life. Sure. And, and as you and, mature, and then, you know, you want, you mentioned, I, I just want to include this before I forget it because I, I, I don't want to. I had a, a dear friend, mixed blood Cherokee, who called me in my mid 40s to inform me that, you know, in our tradition, you cannot join a council or form your own until you're 51. So this is an indigenous philosophy, right? That, and as, as I step back, and, and I'm sure you can too now that I mentioned it, it's like, okay, at that age, you've developed the wisdom to actually be part of it. Because until that time, there's still a lot of reflection going on and, and no real solid foundation until you're a grandfather or even a great-grandfather. Yeah, yeah, it's a definitely different. Okay, so I'm 50 this year. One more year to look to forming a council. Yeah, uh, and you'll be 50 like, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think for me, uh, the path that really... So, you know, I, I tried to... I, did, I went to computer science because it's kind of following the path of my father. And also it was... Uh, enjoyable. I like making stuff and making software is good. A uh, good way to do that. Uh, but I think for me, uh, so one thing, you know, I went the path and the nice thing with software development is, is that you can make a societally quite good salary at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So right out of university, and, and I was never into Ferraris or whatever. So within a year or two from graduating, I had like more money than I could spend on a weekly or monthly basis. Uh, 
so that kind of made me pretty quickly realize that, you know, money doesn't make you happy. And at the same time, I had about a 20 year long journey with, de uh, with depression mm. uh, and, and kind of working with my mental health, uh, you know, tried everything, every, every bit of everything, I think definitely uh, starting to work remotely, which I started to do about 15 years ago and moving out of the city, I really noticed how big an impact, you know, the fact that 10 minutes walk from my house were some hills with trees, you know, not in great forest, but 10 minutes walking, no train, no car, right. nothing, just walking. And I realized what a massive luxury this was, right? To just on your own feet, wander out of your front door and wander into greenery. Uh, that, so that, and then working on my own mental health and starting to read and be much more aware of just the general state of mental health in the world, mm -hmm. it really opened my eyes to like, you know, we have a society where it's like what 40 or 50% of the people are running on antidepressants or painkillers or sleeping pills. I remember right? in the 70s, there was a front cover of, it was, I think at that time it was called New Age Magazine. And the title was A Nation of Addicts. And it was talking about America and prescriptive drug problem. And that was already 50 years ago. That, that was in the 1970s. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, and it's only gotten worse since then. So that's clearly a sign of, and, you know, it's similar in different proportions in all of the Western world. So that's clearly a sign of the society, of society not working. Mm -hmm. Now, in that clearly a sign in, in your own depression, if you wouldn't mind reflecting on that just a little, was this the, the cause, I guess, or the, the root of it, the, the sense of disconnectedness that was present in your location and, and the people around you? And I'm speaking to the nature of being a highly, highly sensitive individual that would almost become an emotional sponge for the general sense of what's going on in your location. Was it that or was it something specific I mean, to you or maybe a little of both? It's, it's clearly a combination of things. I mm -hmm. think my mother also struggled with her her mental health and until until the end. She, she died quite young at 49. So mm -hmm. dealing with her passing away and you know, it's the straw that that broke the camel's back or the combination of straws, right? But sure. it's not the straw's fault, right? It's everything right, right. else. So I, I'm sure it was, you know, I don't blame society for everything. I don't blame my genetics for everything. I don't break my, don't blame my parents for everything. It's a combination of all of these things coming together. Right. There were just more than this particular human being's inborn nervous system was capable of handling sure and i don't uh, get the sense that you're pointing fingers or blaming anything this is just a reflection of the process that you were going and, through without and, attachment yeah and you know the the highly sensitive is only recently did i heard, discovered the highly sensitive person uh set of traits and i was like wow uh, but already for quite a few years, you know, I, I kind of been thinking of myself as the canner in the coal mine, mm. right? By being more highly sensitive, it's not that, um, yeah, I mean, in some ways I'm weaker to the, to the shit and bullshit that the world throws at us, but I'm the canner in the coal mine. It's, you know, it's a sign of the world. Right. And you take it and do something with it as opposed to push it aside or, or deny it in any way that you you see it as and i could be wrong in this but it seems and, and do you see that as more of an opportunity to explore further questions as you mentioned earlier yeah i think it's it's definitely i've as i've gotten older i've go, grown to understand that it's just me and this is how I am and yeah I mean for sure it, it gives me curiosity uh, to explore more 
to explore more questions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of overcoming depression, definitely one part was just getting bored with it. It's like, I, I can't be, you know, and of course, you know, I, I don't, uh, there are people who are much worse than me. I, I was always able to get out of bed in the morning. I appreciate right. there are people who aren't. So it, it wasn't, but it was still a struggle. So I think one part was, uh, yes, uh, bored of it. Another part was, it's interesting because now they, they say that the whole, the, the Prozac book, uh, the thing it's no longer true, but like accepting that it's not my fault. I was just born this way. But then there is also curiosity, right? Uh, and I think as I get older, I have more and more curiosity, right? It's like, how the heck did we end up with this set of world culture and reality, which makes so many people, myself uh, included, uh, live, have to struggle most of their lives mm -hmm. or a lot of their lives. Right. And it just that intrinsically, I would offer that it just doesn't make sense. And there's that feeling and what kinds of questions did you find that came from there? What did you, yeah, what kind of questions did you uh, popped up for you that you began exploring early on? Uh, well, I think definitely for me, the qu one key question has been, how the heck did we get here? Hmm. And by how did we get here? You know, I'm interested. I really, I love reading two kinds of history books, either something that's like a pinpoint in history. Like, for example, I read about the, the early start of money in the UK when the early industrializations, like 20, 30 years of history and all of the people trying to make the, the, it's fascinating. Or big sweeps, you know, like, I don't think if you look at 100 or 200 years of history for most things, when you get to, if you want to look at big trends of society, 200, 300 years is not enough, right? right? You know, the right. first big break point was agriculture. So I started reading and, you know, people, it's like, oh, you know, what's the natural way of humans? And people look a hundred years back or 150 years back at farmers, it's like bullshit. You have to look before agriculture, right? You know, agriculture is 5,000, maybe 7,000 years of history. A human homo sapiens is hundred to 200,000 years. And then other hominids, let's say 2 million years of continuing evolution of the species. Clearly 5,000 years is just a tiny drop in the bucket. So right. you have to look before agriculture. And then now I've been reading a lot like why agriculture? How did we end up with cities? It's fascinating. It's a fascinating history uh, because, you know, this is, people love to believe that there is some cabal and somebody somewhere out there is engineering a shitty reality which makes them really rich and powerful and everybody else miserable. Unfortunately, I think the reality is much worse. Nobody's in charge. And through a bunch of people trying to do their best for what made sense to them or what they thought was good, we've ended up with a shitty world. Uh, so th there is the book I haven't read about it, but called The Banality of Evil looking at, of course, everybody's favorite boogeyman, the Nazis. And it was just, you know, a bunch of middle-aged guys going home to their wives, doing what they thought was the right thing to do. It was very banal. People expected, you know, like, yes, there were some monsters, of course, but the predominantly it was just, you know, middle bureaucrats doing middle bureaucrat shit, right? Right. Uh, right. You make a great point because we tend to want to point fingers and blame, right? And in that process of pointing fingers and blaming, there's three coming back at us that we ignore, you know, kind of like that inner life we were talking about. We're bereft of understanding that we're responsible for how we think and feel. Nobody else, right? And what we do with that, nobody else, right? Those are choices that we make and actions that we take based on those. and. I love how you looked at the, you know, the big picture with the, 
the evolving planetary civilization, if you will, that goes through different phases. And I would venture to say that we're not alone in that, that that same pattern is repeated across the universe on planets that are developing just like we are. And that the best of intentions of those who are the, the curious sorts to begin with you know, I don't know if this can be done. Well, let's find out. Let's see what happens, right? Those kinds of questions and activities don't necessarily um, come up with the best or the greatest answers or proce processes or, or even projects. What they do come up with are just opportunities to do something differently. And that differently doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It just means it's different. And as we develop these differences <laughs> we've kind of gone to that place where we have too many differences now and especially with covid it, it's distributed those differences globally to where we were told to be afraid of each other because of those differences now we're coming back together so, and so looking I, at i will I, I will disagree with you because if we don't disagree it's just going to be oh yeah bad. absolutely i'm open totally open for that I don't think we have too many differences. I think we actually have not enough differences in terms of different people trying new economic, community, other systems. I what totally agree I with think, you on that. What I think we don't have is the ability to have a good, healthy, integrative conversation across differences. Agreed. So... If, this is that's the point I was making. Those differences have, have brought us to the point where we all have different dictionaries. We're speaking to each other from our own dictionary and not understanding the other, which causes that um I don't want to say conflict, miscommunication. Yeah, yeah. And th that's where I really think we one path to help with that is to go back and start with questions mm -hmm. you know it's, it's at a very basic level like i have this regularly in life working with people or even with my wife my wife will come up to me and say can you help me do x and i'll reflect and i go sometimes sometimes it's clear and sometimes it doesn't make sense and i'm like what problem are you trying to solve mm -hmm. And then she tells me what problem she's trying to solve. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There is this way, which is much easier. will let you achieve your goal. Whilst if I had just asked, you know, gone and helped her do what she was asking me, we would have both wasted much more time. Right. So, you know, if we don't have enough conversation of what is the problem you're trying to solve, and that's, you know, forming that as a question is one way of doing it, then, you know, it's just always solution A versus solution B. And then, you know, you have solution A t-shirts, I have solution B t-shirts. And if we're lucky, we're just separate football clubs. If we're unlucky, we've got guns facing each other, you know? Right, right. And, and the point that you made is so, in my opinion, exquisite and prevailing, right? This is a business question. What problem... Every business, every entrepreneur starts with, here's the problem, a def defining a problem that they have a solution for, right? Or hopefully. And yet we don't realize the trickle through of that question into the interpersonal relationships as well as the intimate relationships that we have. And those kinds of conversations we've never discovered or been taught how to have they're something that's completely uh i don't want to say completely new but in a lot of ways it's new to a lot of people because they've never developed the critical thinking enough to actually have those kinds of questions yeah i mean we don't have enough environments where we really get a chance to practice are encouraged to practice uh, those kinds of integrative conversations across differences. Uh, uh, on my journey of, because my interest really is how to build villages and, and, you know, I identified a bunch of things which would be required to enable people to escape the city. 
one of which is learning for kids. So I went on a journey learning about, you know, what is learning and alternative theories and so on and so forth. Uh, Peter Gray is an amazing authority on that. He's written a Indeed. really great book. And in his, one of his blogs I read, they did a study when kids free play. And free play means just a bunch of kids in a field, like no referee, they're not playing soccer, they're just like a bunch of kids trying to figure out whether to play cops and robbers or house or whatever. Right. Kids spend like something like 60 or 70% of their time together negotiating the rules of play. And like, you'd be like, that's crazy. But then you're like, my God, what a great preparation. Oh, absolutely. Life in a society mm -hmm. where you have agency, right? That's true anarchist organization, right? Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody has more power. I mean, some, that doesn't mean some people don't have authority because they're older or because they brought the football or whatever, right. but nobody really has power. And the goal is to continue playing, right? And, and having fun. Yeah, yeah. The goal is to have fun. Uh, but the second we hit school, you know, there's so many studies, right? What is school? What does school teach you? Sit down, shut up. And if you collaborate with somebody, that's called cheating and it's punished. Right? It's, it's clearly, you know, it, it made sense in a 19th century industrial world, maybe. I don't know. But it certainly doesn't make sense in the 21st, 21st century world. So, and then, you know, we go into, or many people go and many companies are still structured around power lines. So, you know, and, and with neighbors, right? You know, you don't talk with neighbors. It was very funny, uh, this uh, festival that I organized two weeks ago, I really stayed on the sidelines and I was like, you know, I'm creating this space. This kind of, the, the concept was to do it like Burning Man, right? So everybody comes and plays, you know, it's right. not pre-organized, pre pre-planned. And of course, as always, there was somebody playing loud music and somebody came up to me and like one thirty or something, it's like, you're the organizer. Are you not going to do anything about it? They're like, it's past one. We said one. And I had like short, but very short. I should do something. I was like, no. Take your need for power and authority and shove it, you know, like your neighbors, you go talk to them. This is like the most friendly environment you can imagine. You right. go talk to your neighbors. Don't call the police. Right, right, right? But right. we don't have this, you know, the, the, we don't have enough of this sitting in council and having integrative conversations with people that we care about or that we care about keeping in the, in the game right. and continue to have fun having uh, playing with so we're, we're just losing the skills plus on top of we were very good at having those skills in tribal setting of tens of people maybe 100 120 doing this on the scale of millions let alone hundreds of millions or billions has never been done so it's a very hard problem no wonder we're struggling but mm -hmm. but yeah i mean i hope we can do better we have to do better well and and in our reflections and how we're interacting with each other, um, developing the more, like how we met, you invited me to do a, a presentation on the school model that I came up with after teaching high school for a number of years in various settings and the, the need for holistic education and accessing or assessing the students on the way in, of, you know, what their proclivities are, what their aptitudes are, what their attitudes are and then help to guide them into areas that actually fulfill those passions that they naturally have with the skill set that they were born with, obviously, right? We don't explore those kinds of things. And now we are as adults and, and this opportunity that we're having in, in uh, expanding the smaller village mentality into the global village to where we can all learn how to get along, first of all. And this seems to be coming not just from this inner desire that we have, it's also coming from all the communications we're having from people from elsewhere that are being present. So there's this, hey guys, you need to grow up. You need to learn how to get along. Then there will be ample help. 
to help you in the next phases. But you've got to learn to share a planet together in harmony with each other and the planet first. Because until you do that, the rest of it's kind of worthless. Right? Yeah. So uh, this actually, it made me think, and I want to connect with the initial question of what is regeneration? So uh, this idea of connecting humans to humans, for me, regenerative organizations, so creating organizations along different lines where we can be our own full humans, where we can express ourselves, when we can have these integrative conversations, is a key part of it. That was, we're working on a regenerative village here uh, in Portugal and, you know, building real estate village, it's, you know, years, many years project. And sometimes it feels like a long march, like, oh my God, when are we gonna get to it? But then a few months into the process, I had an epiphany, right? We need to be living and working in the culture that we want to create. Absolutely. I, doesn't that just make sense? Right? We can't stand from out. It's like any system that you're going to change, you can't do it from outside of it. Uh, it makes sense. But, you know, I was really shocked. I, I've been really interested in new organizations, future of work and, and this kind of space for about five, six, seven years. Uh, so I, I go to, when I was living in London, I went to various meetups and it was really shocking to me to discover quite a few people came from the not-for-profit, non-governmental sector, and they described horrific, horrifically toxic work environments, psychological abuse, you know, like, and I was like, wow, because we have this image of not-for-profits, you know, charities, they're so nice. And they describe, people describe horrible working environments. So interestingly enough, in many places in, in the old system, people believed that you could do good in the world whilst being a not-so-good company on the inside. And I think for me, the re regenerative mindset, because it's a mindset, is you understand that it's all connected. You mm -hmm. know, you can't have a shitty company doing good in the world. It just doesn't work. And on the flip side, I think if you have a good company where people are living, working, connected to their purpose, uh, people are connected to each other, they feel heard, seen, able to express themselves, I think it's very unlikely that that kind of organization would do shitty things in the world. Absolutely. And, and that's, uh, I love that you brought this up in that creating those conversations, this is part of, you know, since we've met there, there's been all kinds of things happen and uh, my interviewing the founder of Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement and then becoming part of that and then helping it to evolve by asking it questions, kind of like, you know, exactly what you're talking about. And then evolving with it, doing the things that are necessary to create those opportunities of cross-pollination, so to speak. Like with, um, we recently chose to start a series of la what we call lounges, right? Where we have some people from the Live and Let Live movement that are talking about the principles, the legal and, and moral principles of don't be an aggressor and be a good human. And then we're also opening up to other alliances for organizations to have their conversations as well and providing a, an opportunity for others to engage in that cross-pollination process and ask questions and find out more. You know, the, those things are, are critical. And like you say, if you don't live in it, how can you do it, right? So we're doing those things that we see are potentially that are necessary to begin with to create those kinds of conversations. And it's happening virtually first, which is what's available now, far more than the on ground is based on what's been happening. Those situations are beginning to turn around now too. And the on ground activities are increasing uh, again, thankfully, right? <laughs> it's like, man, finally, the, the people are starting to get out and be happy again and, and commune with each other and nature. So how do you see this 
kind of evolving and, and what do you what might you anticipate as evidence that it's working so speaking of I, being an imagineer right so i think this is it here we are uh what i am uh, you know a key part of regenerative is ecosystem thinking systems thinking living systems uh, thinking so really looking at bigger systems and i think this conversation that we're having now, we're cross pollinating we're inspiring each other. Very much what you mentioned, that you said other organizations, you're having conversations, you're supporting each other. I am getting a sense that as we move forward into this new mindset, collaboration between organizations will become the default. So really, definitely in the regenerative space, you know, I don't know so much, uh, you just told me about your project today, but I know that if you succeed, that helps all of us. I'm happy to support you in succeeding whatever way you want. And that's kind of the default mindset in the regenerative uh, space, I think. You know, we are part of an ecosystem and as the healthier the ecosystem gets, the healthier all of us get. So I am starting to see and imagine inklings of new, more ecosystemic ways of collaborations emerging and really richer, because of course, you know, okay, every economy is an ecosystem. Things are bought and, bought and sold, you know, there is, business rotary clubs and people talk to each other, but, and it was probably actually richer in the early business world, right? If you think of small town business world, you know, the, the business street, people talk to each other and they supported each other more as things went global, we lost that. So, you know, in a way, I guess one could say, as we said with the conversations, right? We knew how to have a conversation in a tribe of 20, 50, hundred people. How do we do that with 10 billion? Similarly, I think this defaulting to mutual support and seeing each other as being in the same boat, we knew how to do this in a tribe of 10, 20, 100 people. How do we do it with 100 billion people and technology enough to destroy the planet? Right. Uh, you know, people, people look to... Uh, indigenous tribes and such as being more sustainable and such. And of course they were, but they didn't have nuclear weapons, chemical pesticides, and all other kinds of mass technologies, which is very easy to destroy yourself with. So within their technological framework, they figured out how to be in harmony with the environment. Though actually, to be honest, looking at history, not every indigenous tribe, there is lots that wipe themselves out along the way. Oh, sure. Their sure. island. You know, we, we have survivor bias. The ones which we came in contact with were still alive, so they had figured it out. Well, it's like history I, written by the victors, not the vanquished, right? Yeah. So now it's how do we figure out to do this at global scale? How do we figure out when it's working is, I think, when we see more collaboration and mutual support between different organizations, more people in the mindset of collaboration, more conversations like this happening. Uh, and also, I think, because for me, you know, regeneration is, it's not about charity. It's not about like, oh, yes, I give 5% of my money to Greenpeace or something like that. It's about having a fully integrated life where your livelihood is regenerative and supporting the, the biosphere and, right. and all of this. So I think, and we are seeing this, and this is what I really like, because I was always for environmentalism. I even sent some money to Sea Shepherd once, but I somehow was never, my heart and soul was not drawn to that movement. I mean, I would still love to, you know, get arrested, chained to a log somewhere, <laughs> to a tree somewhere, <laughs> but somehow it, that wasn't like, I didn't feel my strongest calling there. I like the regenerative idea because it's, forward looking of how can we create and build and do good right now do you so, see go ahead 
Fish so thought. yes, so I think we we will see it working when we have more and more people that are able to make their livelihood in a regenerative way. People are able to say, yes, I recognize how the way I, I, I don't want to call it work because it becomes much more than this, right? Uh, yeah, and I kind of like the, the life term clerk, energy. you know, it's play and work combined. And, and if you're not having fun with it and you're doing something wrong, or at least that's the current adage, right? And maybe that's more true than we realize. Speaking more true than we realize, how, what do you think about, you know, we're talking about systemic change, which means many systems within this global environment are about to change. Do you, do you feel like the structures themselves or, or you know, you mentioned the, the millions, if not billions of people having the tribal conversations. I wonder if that's really necessary or if it's, oh, if it works out that those who do choose to have these conversations actually are the forerunners and leaders of the sweeping changes and it's not necessarily the uh, huge shift in division division of labor it's the how we engage that labor that shifts because it's a different mindset it's a different heart set um, and speaking of the indigenous it takes us to the first brain and, and the gut feeling of what's good what's right what's true what's helpful what's encouraging and empowering to each other in the process do you see that kind of happening or, or do you see it more a, a need to engage a larger ba population base? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I figured that was coming. All right. I set myself up for that one, didn't I? So I think, you know, what I think is, and I think live, live and let live is a perfect example of that, right? You're a small organization, but you're a global organization. And this is where the internet coming in, you know, internet is kind of becoming the, the neural network of the global brain, right? Yeah. And of course we need all kinds of top-down efforts, you know, they can't stop UN SDGs and all of that. And it's all beautiful and necessary, but we have a lot of top-down going in the world. I think what's really exciting is that we can have so much bottom up horizontal collaboration. Mm -hmm. And for me, that doesn't mean that everybody will become part of live and let live or any other kind of global organization, because that would be homogenization and that would be stupid and boring. But what I think it does mean is that anybody who wants and who reaches out a significant number of, of people is involved in some sort of horizontal collaboration, right? You know, living, if I'm living in a village somewhere in some river in Africa, maybe live and let live is, I don't care, but I have a problem with local fisheries. And if I can somehow connect with other villages in Asia, in South America and whatever that have a similar environment to me and a similar problem with fisheries, and we start talking about that, that's much more relevant and that allows this horizontal bottom up global collaboration. Right. And it's so necessary. This is, um, it's part of that evidence, right? Where the right questions are being asked, or at least better questions are being asked of how to deal with the solutions or how to access them. And there's more people involved to help the process along. Whereas when we didn't have the, the internet or the global brain, um, another great book by Howard Bloom, I was going to mention the Lucifer principle earlier, as far as studying the historical significance of how populations were manipulated by small groups of people over time, by outright lies and control of the media stream, whether it's a town crier or the internet. We've had to face that, and especially lately in working through that, not necessarily getting stuck in it, but looking beyond it and having these kinds of conversations that you and I are right now. And we're not the only ones that are doing this, right? These kind of conversations are happening offline 
everywhere. We just happen to be online and, and hopefully giving a reference point for others to tune into and get some real solid information or, or at least some solid questions as to where we might go with it, right? How do you see this process um, evolving and, and with the, the idea or the notion that there's a, some small significant piece of advice that you can give to people who are facing these changes today what how yeah what how here's that uh, no, i'm not going to lock up i'm going to ask the question how do you see that happening what kind of an advice or what kind of advice would you give those who are beginning to ask questions that may have a skill set that's contributory in some way that they're looking for a place Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing is reach out and reach out and talk to others. Uh, I think a key thing that can be really crushingly overwhelming is if you open yourself up to all of the world's problems, you know, like you're, you're never going to address them, right? You're not even, even going to address a meaningful amount. So I think in order to live a joyous life and you have this life, you might as well live it joyously. You really need to figure out how to develop this mindset of today and attitude. Today I did everything that I reasonably could being the limited human being in this body that I am. And thus I'm going to allow myself to sleep soundly. Because if you don't have that, then you just live a life in misery and that will grind you down. And, you know, I almost died from stress twice, once from a bleeding ulcer. I had a stroke, right? And now I'm kind of like, what the hell is the point of dying from stress, right? That's not going to achieve anything. So I think really the, the put your own oxygen mask on first, right? There, there is a very, it's very important that, they keep on repeating you because when you see everything on fire, you see little kids, the instinct is to try and help others. But if you don't have your own oxygen mask on first and burnout is a massive problem, as you probably know, it's a massive problem in the environmental movement, in all of the social justice movements, right? It's a massive burnout is a massive problem because people just drive themselves into the ground. Right. That in the long run, in the medium run, that doesn't serve, solve, uh, serve anyone. In the short run, you're not going to solve the big problems anyways. So put your own oxygen mask on first. Uh, that's one. The other one is connect and really appreciate, you know, I guess maybe this is part of old, old men speaking, but it applies at any age. Appreciate how to manage your own energy effectively. So that's kind of the next, the, the first step is don't kill yourself. The next step is figure out how to manage your energies most effectively. And a, a key part of that is, I think it's not just the physical one, but also to really stay motivated and stay inspired. You know, the world might be going to hell, but still, if we don't dance and sing with joy, sometimes life is not worth living and we, we won't be able to have the energy to go on. So we have to give ourselves the time to sing and dance sometimes. And it's much more joyous, actually, if you're doing it with another other group of people that are working and believe in similar things as you. So don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't underestimate the value of celebration. And celebration is not just hedonistic separation. It's also reflection. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling of gratitude. It's a feeling of appreciating the lessons that you've learned. You know, you can think of it as fuck ups or you can think of it like, wow, I learned so much. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so are there moments of awe? Yes. Uh, I 
personally don't have a strong religious or spiritual practice. So I'm not able to say whether moments of awe is something you can engineer in your life. For me personally, I it's partially gratitude, partially nature uh, appreciation. I cultivate the, the skill and the ritual of experience micro joy, micro moments of awe in nature. You know, like there's this time of the year, there's these spiders with this crazy, and I'll just sit there for five minutes, allow myself to just sit there for five minutes looking at the spider and, and feeling how utterly beautiful it is. Right. Just That's trying what to. I'm talking about that, that moment of awe where you just uh, you appreciate. You don't know how things work. You don't know why they work. They do. And, and you're just in awe of that. Magnificent. Yeah, I, th I think maybe, you know, because for many people, awe is like I went and I had a download, you know, white light. I was one with God. And maybe some people experience that. And maybe sometimes you can experience that in your life. But I think it's unreliable. Uh, but if you teach yourself to take a moment and smell the roses, to take right. a moment and look, uh, you know, then this is accessible to you almost any day, almost any time. And it's very nourishing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're, you're right. You know, the, the one-time experiences really are of no consequence. Yeah. They might give you the indication of what to do, but it's embracing, embodying, uh, living that at a very intimate level that truly makes the difference in your life and the lives of others. Yep. Yep. And, and, uh, and that is accessible. I think the, the, it is the, the big, the big moments of, you know, having your mind split open and all of this, if you do experience them, it's a kind of a life bonus, but many people don't. Some people are, have more proclivity to, to, than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, but nature Some is people are just born naturally with this intrinsic programming right <laughs> it's just who they are there's no religion there's no spirituality there's no psychology there, there's nothing other than they they just are who they are right those yeah. are the ones that are just great leaders and great inspirators and sometimes conspirators too right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually, I, I will, I will share. I, I had a nice, tiny, ti tiny experience like this. So this year I went, I used to go much more to music festivals, but then got an older and this and that, but I went to a, a big trans, medium sized, but very wonderful trans festival here. Okay. Uh, took LSD for the first time in a long time, but, you know, kind of wondering at one point I saw like one of those little lizards running and, you know, they always run away from you. Sure. And I was like, I had nothing to do. I was like, I sat down and it ran away a little way. And then it sat there. And maybe because I was high, maybe because I was patient, I just sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there. And it got bored of sitting and it looked up and it looked at me and it walked towards me. Oh, wow. And it almost sat on my leg and it kind of like walked around and then like sat with its back towards me very close, which meaning it trusted me. And it was just like, Wow, you know, I spent my whole life trying to chase the little guys. And here I just sat. I didn't do anything. I just sat completely still. And it walked towards me. It was, you know, it was really beautiful. It really touching exactly a moment of awe of connection with nature. Sure, sure. And, and the fact that you allowed yourself the freedom to uh, have the experience, right? Um, it opened that door for you just... And, you know, LSD is not that, you know, it's not the devastating drug that, you know, it was promoted to be for many, many years. And there's a lot of studies now that, that medical studies that are using it for some tremendous healing capacity that it has of traumas and, and things of that nature. When you're in that place, speaking of nature, of being still, nature responds because you're, this triggers, it's almost like the substance, the catalyst in it shuts off 
the compartmentalization of, that the brain normally has of trying to manage everything. And it just allows you to be in that moment and be totally free of the desire to control. All you want to do is just observe and love the moment, if I can use that term. And the lizard responded to it. That's a sense. That's a feeling that is that we can produce simply by the mindset that we carry. And we don't need the acid or the white light experience or anything like that. It's just a simple choice and a practice. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, as I hear us talk here, you know, you ask me for recommendations. I think it's really worth learning how to use nature experiences with more intentionality to hear, heal yourself. Mm -hmm. And we'll invite everyone to do so in your own way as soon as you possibly can get out and have an experience in nature yourself. Victor, this has been such a wonderful experience, um, well worth the wait. And I appreciate your time and your energy, your devotion to the work and, uh, and your ability to share with me now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the conversation. Oh, it's you're been welcome. A pleasure. And namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time.